And that's why we've created a special program full of villainous music and some tunes accompanying the superheroes who defeat them. So excited to preview our upcoming Halloween concert, Villains and Superheroes, taking place this weekend at the River Loop Amphitheater in Waterloo. Now this is our second installment of Sound Insights, which is our pre-concert talk, little preview of things to experience on the concert and some more insight into the music. And as you can see, I'm kind of a big kid when it comes to Halloween and this talk is really designed for kids of all ages. Um, we know we're gonna have a lot, lots of young people here at this concert as well as some, uh, some of their parents, grandparents, and maybe just symphony lovers coming out to enjoy some great music. And, um, and I really wanted to get into why I chose these pieces for an event like this with an audience of such diverse ages and also for a really fun occasion, Halloween. We've done some great programs for this time of year. In fact, a number of years ago, I came out on stage with this mask on, <laughs> dressed as Darth Vader. Now, Vader may make an appearance because he, of course, is one of film's great villains, but we're branching out a little bit. We've got some music that we haven't heard on these programs in the past. And we're doing, um, we're doing something really fun in combining the film music and orchestral epics that are on this concert. This is kind of the, the methodology of these concerts, a bit different from what you might see at other orchestras. I think typically film music concerts are just full of film music. We like to mix them up. We really like to feature music from films and the music that inspired these film soundtracks. Um, that's a piece of this puzzle that sometimes gets left out when orchestras present film music concerts. And so that's one of our big priorities. Because in the end, composers like John Williams and Alan Silvestri, uh, the composers we're gonna feature on the film side of this program, really have been incredibly inspired by the orchestral tradition, and in particular, kind of a certain subset of composers from that tradition. We're talking about uh, kind of all these great orchestral symphonies and tone poems, big pieces written from, I don't know, let's say the middle of the 19th century into the early 20th century. This music has a tremendous influence on what we hear in so many films, starting with films way back in the earlier 20th century, all the way up through today. So the last 70 or 80 years of film music has been hugely influenced by this tradition of great orchestral music. Um, now, why is that? That's, that's a question I wanted to touch on a little bit here in this Sound Insights, because I don't think we always uh, take the time to think through the reasons for this. Um, you know, uh, in music, and I learned this as a conductor, um, you can really be connected to a tradition through your teacher. Um, in fact, my teacher had, um, had his lessons when he was younger with an individual who had studied with Brahms. And so for those of us who studied with this guy, we felt like we were connected to Brahms. Um, and, and that kind of lineage tends to be very strong in music, both as it flows through people and especially as it flows through traditions and musical styles. And that's something that I've talked about on and on and on over the years, uh, discussing the lineage between different pieces and composers and styles and how they're connected, because really one of the great things about this whole tradition is the connectedness. That's what we love about it, and that's something I love to talk about as well. So, going back to the subject at hand, how did this film music wind up sounding like, you know, massive symphonic tone bones from the 19th century? Well, it's very similar to the story I just gave you about my own conducting teacher. Um, composers obviously mentored by the older generation as they're coming up. And, uh, and then as they uh, become more established, they begin to teach younger musicians and those musicians then become connected to the previous generation. So we think about all of these artists from Europe who emigrated to the United States, particularly in the 1930s into the early 40s during World War II. And we know, you know some of the greatest um, uh, artistic figures in the world, um, and especially musicians, moved to the U.S. You can name a couple who lived right near where I grew up in Los Angeles, Igor Stravinsky and Arnold Schoenberg, kind of the twin poles of, of modern music at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, they both lived in, in the neighborhood that I grew up in. It's, it's, it's pretty mind-blowing to think about it. Um, but so many artists came over to the U.S. and of course they brought with them all of their work. And quite a few went to Hollywood. I just mentioned Schoenberg and Stravinsky were in L.A. where there were tons of European artists who came over um, worked in New York and theater and in music, but also came out to Hollywood. And many of the composers during this period of time, the 1940s and 50s, had roots in Europe 
or had been living in Europe or been trained there. So not a huge surprise that at the start of this period that we're talking about, you know, late 30s going into the 40s and 50s, and this is really the period of time when when Hollywood begins to produce these epic movies that require these epic soundtracks. You know, not a, not a big surprise that we hear echoes of, you know, Mahler and Strauss and Tchaikovsky, all of these composers, um, their uh, DNA, their fingerprints uh, are all over this Hollywood music from this period. But that, um, uh, that process persisted and uh, much of it is due to the work of one man and that's John Williams. We've talked a lot about John Williams here at WCF Symphony in the past. He's one of my favorite composers and I believe he's one of the greatest American composers of all time, regardless of genre. I doubt many people would argue with me, but we see him as a film composer, not as much of a stage composer. We certainly have performed some of his concert music. It's been wonderful, including a highlight performance of his trumpet concerto that was given by Randy Grabowski with the orchestra. Um, we've done a lot of his film music, different pieces, of course, from Star Wars and Harry Potter on the Halloween concerts we did a number of years back. So we will feature a bit of that music again. There's obviously great heroes and heroines in Star Wars and some of John Williams' other movies like Superman. So we're gonna, we're gonna bring out some of those, those tunes that you know so well by John Williams. And I think what you're going to hear in those pieces is the undeniable influence of this amazing generation of orchestral composers uh, with a strong emphasis on the Russian composers. So to, to kind of mirror John Williams, we're gonna include music by Tchaikovsky, the Sixth Symphony. I just mentioned John Williams' score for Superman. Well, there's no piece in the classical canon that, that connects to Superman, like the third movement of Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony. Not that Tchaikovsky was thinking of a hero when he wrote the music, but just the musical style is something which Williams picked up on and used not only in his Superman march, but in other places. Um, uh, this is, um, you know, audible in lots of different things in the music. One, one of the um, musical details I point to is the use of the triplet, da, 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 da. You know, that, that, um, that type of sound, especially when used in the right context and, and um, featured in the brass and the percussion, uh, has this, this really um, amazing kind of powerful effect. And John Williams uses that quite a bit in his music and it, it seems to come right out of composers like Tchaikovsky. And I don't think John Williams has been very shy about um, acknowledging the influences in his music um, I think he's really wise to do so because that really is one of the things that makes him great. The ability to take bits and pieces and ideas, themes uh, from within the musical tradition and make them his own, sort of reuse them for his own purposes, apply them for a different purpose. Uh, and so we have these sort of similarities or, or connections in the music um, that take on an added dimension, of course, in this case, as accompaniment to these incredible, unforgettable film heroes and villains. So we're pretty excited to do some John Williams on this program and we'll have some things that are printed in the program and we also have a couple of surprises coming from John Williams. Very excited about that. We have some other film music on this program by a really wonderful composer named Alan Silvestri. And Alan has been at this for a long time, you know, going all the way back to the, to the Back to the Future movies, um, which were favorites of mine when I was a kid. And of course, writing much of the music for the uh, Marvel Avengers series. We're gonna play music from two different Avengers movies by Alan Silvestri. And again, this is music that shows many of the hallmarks of this late 19th century, early 20th century, sort of romantic, post-romantic orchestral tradition, um, large orchestras, really wonderful brass writing, lots of virtuosic wind writing with big wind sections. And of course, the sound of just a, a fantastic, you know, a symphonic string section. Uh, but composers like Silvestri also, um, I think, often no uh, give nod to more contemporary styles. And you'll hear, you know, a drum set in the music or uh, something that sounds a little bit more contemporary, perhaps drawn a bit from pop music. And I think in Silvestri, you hear more of that combination of the symphonic style and then bits and pieces that come out of more contemporary music. Uh, that's one of the things that I think really makes the Marvel series wonderful in general. It, it's kind of at once uh, fantasy looking back to comic books and older characters. And at the same time, um, the, the whole, these whole series of films seems to have a foot in the contemporary world as well. A little bit less pure fantasy than something like Star Wars. So I think Silvestri's music really reflects that. We hear that uh, in his style. 
We're going to surround his music and John Williams' music with a few other pieces that we think are appropriate, in particular for Halloween, because another element of this program is the, um, the presence of costumes everywhere. I love looking out in the audience at uh, this time of year and just seeing tons of kids and quite a few adults dressed up in costumes. Those of you who have been to our Halloween events know that I will often appear in costume. And uh, you know, since this is a pre-concert talk, I'll give you a little insight into that. I will appear in costume again, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is. It's gonna be a really great surprise. It'll happen right during the program. But while we're talking about costumes, I do want to remind you that we have a costume contest. It begins 30 minutes before the show at 3.30, and you can sign in as early as three o'clock. Judging wraps up about 10 minutes before the show. Then we're gonna announce the winners on the stage. This is always a fun moment in our program. Uh, some special prizes, and of course there's something for everyone at this show. We're going to have candy, trick-or-treating, uh, there's going to be snacks and food available. Um, just a, an incredible environment to enjoy Halloween with the kids. Looks like a good weather day too. I should also mention if you're on the fence about wearing a costume that you'll have a chance to strut it in front of the whole audience at Riverloop. Because every time we perform on Halloween, we feature a costume parade. And I'm not gonna say too much more about it because it's fun to keep it a surprise, but it's really a blast having, having especially kids come up and parade their way across the stage as we play this special piece of music that we've chosen for our costume parade, which is very much one of the types of works that has influenced films. In fact, it has appeared as a uh, sound bed for one of the most famous film directors of all time, Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, the piece I'm talking about is Gounod's Funeral March of a Marionette, and um, you'll recognize it right away, uh, I think from its association with Hitchcock. It's also our spooky, but super fun uh, costume parade accompaniment. So please do wear your costume, march with me and all the kids in our Halloween costume parade. All right, so what else do we need to know about this concert? It proceeds without an intermission, and we've actually shortened it a little bit because we're going to be performing, of course, outside at River Loop. And I wanted to comment on that briefly. You know, we plan months and months ahead of time. And this summer, when uh, the situation with the Delta variant of COVID-19 was getting um, pretty dire, to be honest, we felt that our fall events really needed to change to be able to accommodate what was happening with Delta. And of course, to make sure that kids in particular can enjoy the symphony and parents don't have to feel that it's not a safe environment. So we moved this show from the Gallagher to Riverloop Amphitheater. Of course, a big risk with the weather in Iowa at Halloween. It can be snowing or it can be almost tropical, so you never know what's going to happen. It looks like we'll be lucky this year. And if, uh, if you're still on the fence when you get up on the morning of the show, check out the weather forecast. I think it's going to be beautiful, perfect weather for popping on the costume and coming out for a little afternoon trick-or-treating and some incredible music by this wonderful orchestra. It's been just fantastic to have the orchestra back together, of course, doing outdoor concerts here all summer and into the fall. And, and of course, um, we'll be able to go back indoors and do some more shows over the winter. So we're really excited about that. And if you haven't heard the group play this summer yet, they're just sounding wonderful. You know, it's like, it's like these musicians uh, didn't even miss a step, you know, they just they just were able to come back together after a year and pick up right where we left off making incredible music. And that's what we're going to do for Halloween on Saturday at the River Loop Amphitheater, some incredible film music surrounded by the classical epics that inspired it. Please do join us and can't wait to see you there in your amazing Halloween costumes. <laughs>